Genesis chapter 13. We're very ambitious this morning. We're going to work through the entire chapter, God willing. And as we did last week, I would ask you again if you are able to stand for the reading of God's word. And I pray that as we stand for the reading of God's word, it would not merely be an outward posture, but the inward posture of a heart submissive and reverent to God's life-giving word. Genesis chapter 13. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him, into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. And Lot, who was with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. Now, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other Abram settled in the land of Canaan while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. This is God's word. Thanks be to it. Please remain standing as we pray for the blessing upon the preaching of it. Father, how precious indeed is your word to us. Father, it is a storehouse of goodness and of blessing to us. And I pray now for the Holy Spirit to not only open up the text, but to open up our hearts that we might receive with meekness this implanted word which is able to save our souls. Father, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? Would you give us affections that gladly receive Jesus Christ and his lordship? Father, I, I pray for a radical transformation of our minds this morning, even as we gaze upon Christ and his word. Father, I pray for those who are unbelievers. I pray that you would pull them up out of Sodom. Would you show them that apart from Christ, they are wicked sinners before you? Father, I pray for those who may be like Lot, who are followers of Christ, and yet whose hearts are so often inclined to the fertility of Egypt and the worldliness of Sodom. I pray, Father, that you would awaken them. Father, I pray for those of us who are like Abraham, have stumbled and skinned our knees and are in need of a word of the Lord, are in need, Lord, of a blessing. 
And so, Father, we ask that you would speak to all of us here this morning, whether Sodomites or Lotites or Abramites. Father, we thank you that your word is sharp. We thank you that it can not only discern the hidden intentions of our hearts, but it can also recalibrate our hearts and it can give us warm affections for the things and the only one that matters. Would you do that, Lord? I ask that this would not just be a, another exercise, another sermon, another data transfer of facts. But Father, we pray that we would meet with you, the living God, in Christ, at the altar, through faith, because of the Spirit. This is a supernatural thing, Father. Even as I was reading Brainerd yesterday, I pray that there would be such an outpouring of your Spirit, such a, a torrent that is unstoppable, that even atheists could not argue against the power of the living God. Or would you meet with us, and would you transform us from one degree of glory to another, even this morning, we ask for the glory of Christ, the glorious one, in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I hope that as you gather with us this morning, whether a regular attender or a guest, that you will have come expectant. Perhaps in answer to the prayers of the many, I'm very expectant this morning. And I'm not just saying that for effect. God in his goodness has reminded me of the power of the word and how it can transform us, how it can change a pastor who comes in Lord's Day after Lord's Day and just gives messages and just preaches. Sometimes we can sort of settle in and become complacent. And we can come to church not really expecting to hear from God. And if we're honest, not even wanting to be challenged. I pray to God that you're expecting. Not just the mothers who are expecting, but all of us had come here and saying, Lord, I need to hear from you. I hope that God from his word will speak to you. This is a glorious passage. It is so rich. And I pray that God will help us to feed upon its riches. That it will be more rich to us than the fatness of the choicest cut of meat you could imagine. The Lord actually has gave me the title of this message and it's a fresh start and a needful lesson. A fresh start and a surprising lesson perhaps. Chapter 13 is the narrative of what happened to Abram after his debacle in Egypt. We remember God has spoken to him and then all of a sudden trial comes unexpectedly into Abram's life and instinctually he reacts wrongly. Rather than trusting in the God who can do all things, he descends down into Egypt hoping to save his skin. And we see that it has not ended so well. But what I want you to understand is that chapter 12 and the debacle in Egypt serves for us as a foil this morning of the triumph of chapter 13. Now we're to read chapter 13 against what happened in chapter 12. And I hope it encourages you because Abram has just failed miserably. And I'm so thankful that God in his infinite mercy to his people provides for us fresh starts and second chances. That's what chapter 13 is. It shows us that God offers you a second chance if you would but humble yourself, come up out of Egypt, repent of your sins, and fall before him asking him to lead and guide you. He's offering you a second chance this morning. Perhaps you're still in Egypt, wandering around in the cul-de-sac of futility. He's saying, come back. Come back to me. Let's start fresh. I'll give you another opportunity to walk by faith and to honor me greatly. But there's also a foil within the chapter. Not only do we see Abram in Canaan against the foil of Abram in Egypt, we also see Abram versus Lot. Now, I'm not talking about a physical fist fight, but we're going to see again of how we are to respond positively in the face of trial and how we are not to respond negatively. We're going to see that Lot provides for us the negative foil against 
which Abraham's faith is highlighted. Abram has learned a bitter lesson in Egypt. Rather than trusting in the Lord and walking by faith, he, out of sinful and instinctual self-preservation, has operated, has walked in the flesh. Walking is a huge word in the book of Genesis. And Abram has learned that when we walk in the flesh instead of by the Spirit, we never get to experience or enjoy God's promised blessing. Never. If you're walking in the flesh this morning, whether as a believer or as an unbeliever, you will never experience the blessing God has offered you. Now, if you're an unbeliever, to walk in the flesh is no problem. But as we're going to see with Lot, and as Abram is slowly but surely learning, for a believer to live in the flesh brings great misery. But let's dig into it. I break up the account into five parts. Don't worry about uh, memorizing these points. This is just to help us through the pilgrimage of the text. We begin with a fresh start, and we work our way all the way through to an unforgettable lesson, to a transforming lesson. And so we have here the fresh start beginning in verses 1 to 4. We saw last week that this whole debacle in Egypt is framed around two verbs, going down, coming up. We saw that in verse 10 of chapter 12, there is a great famine in the land, and Abram goes down. He's operating in the flesh. There's a downward spiral spiritually. No altars. No calling upon the Lord. No hearing from the Lord. If you're in the flesh this morning, Christian, don't be surprised if you're not hearing from the Lord. I read my Bible. There's a big difference. There's a lot of Christians who read the Bible perfunctorily, but they're not hearing from the Lord. But praise be to God in his sovereign grace, though Abram of his own will goes down into Egypt, God in his faithfulness brings Abram up. And we see that in chapter 13, verse 1. So Abram went up. Abram came up out of Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him into the Negev. And this is important because if you know your geography well, if you've ever looked at the maps in the back of your Bible, which is why Bibles are better than phones, you will realize that Egypt is south of Canaan. And so as you follow the geographical journey of Abram in chapter 12, that he starts at Bethel at Ai, and everything is good, but then he begins to move southerly, and he moves into the southern part of Canaan, and he's, as it were, on the very edge, on the very boundary, and then he moves out of Canaan into Egypt. And in chapter 13, we see the reverse. That now he's moving northward, that he's beginning in Egypt, and he comes back into the Negev, and there's this transition and ultimately, he's moving by stages. It's the language of a pilgrimage. And he's moving by stages back to the place he was at the beginning. This screams fresh start. Lot is with him, and that will change. But Abram and everything he has is moving back to the land of promise, moving back to the altar, moving back to the God of promise. Before Abram's failure of faith in Egypt, Moses tells us that he journeyed from stages away from the promised land into Egypt. After his failure of faith in Egypt, the reverse is happening. He is traveling in stages back into the land of promise. I pray that's the same for you. Do you understand the great grace there is in the gift of repentance? It's such a negative word, and we should so rejoice in it, that God in his mercy grants us repentance. He enables us to turn around, to get ourselves up out of the muck, and to return back to his presence. Repentance is one of the most glorious words a Christian can know. And it's not a one-time deal. Luther, if you know of, of uh, his 95 Theses, he wanted to teach that the Catholics had got it wrong. He said that the Christian life not only begins with repentance, but the life of the Christian is continual repentance. The Puritans were called the repenters. 
And that was a, uh, an, an insult, or so they thought. And yet, for us to be repenters should be one of the greatest titles we have. Because we're always turning away from the filth and the muck and the mire of Egypt and returning back to the God who is light and life and blessing. Repentance is a fresh start. Repentance is a gift of God. The takeaway is instructive. As great as the folly and unbelief of God's children may be at times, they are no match for God's unwavering faithfulness to keep his promises. Abraham failed. God will not fail. Abraham returns out of his faithfulness to the faithful God. Simply put, God is giving Abram a fresh start. And I can only think of one word to describe this. Grace. Abram had repudiated, at least momentarily, God's promise. And God did not owe Abram anything. He could have left Abram to wallow in the mire of the esquire of Egypt. And yet God loves his children so much he will not let them remain in that state. But the prodigal sons will be awoken. They will come to their senses. They will realize that feeding on the husks that are empty in the land of Egypt is not suitable food. And so God in his grace brings Abram back and he gives him a fresh start. But it's not cheap grace. Abram is returning back to the promised land humbled. That's how you know if repentance has been granted. There's a deep humility that there's no longer this, this trust in yourself, but you realize more acutely how much more you need Christ if you are to live faithfully for him. Abram depended upon the arm of the flesh and he realized that the arm of the flesh always gets him in trouble. That he's not a self-made man. Abram comes back humbled. He returns back to Bethel, the house of God, humble. And that's the only posture that we can ever expect to receive blessing in the house of God is one of humility. Well, I love how Samuel Rutherford said that the way into the kingdom is low. And he had the picture of the drawbridge. We don't know those so much anymore, but back where I'm from, we had drawbridges. And if, if a ship wanted to come under, it has a mast, and it could not come through. And so he says, if the drawbridge does not lift up, the mast must come down. And Rutherford says, it is a low entry into the kingdom of God. And I would say that it's a low entry in the kingdom of God. That God is on a mission to humble his people. And so yes, Abram has come back, and yes, there's repentance, but he comes back with scars. Now, scars aren't a bad thing. Scars are a necessary thing. Scars remind us of how much we need God and how much we fail apart from His grace. And understand that if you are in Egypt, God is seeking to humble you. And if you're a child of God, He will humble you. He will bring you to a place of repentance. And that place of repentance will evince itself in a deep humility. If Abram is going to be a vehicle of God's blessing to the nations, he must learn the painful lesson that trusting in himself and his own resources instead of God and his resources will always end badly. Thankfully, God loves both Abram and the nations too much to leave Abram wandering aimlessly in his cul-de-sac of futility. And so he brings him back to the place where God's grace was earlier and simply embraced. Do you see it in the text? Where is God's grace not only promised and remembered, where is God's grace embraced? The place where God's grace is embraced is at the altar. You see it? Look in verse 4. He came back to the place where he had made an altar at the first. What a glorious word, at the first. In the beginning where Abram first renounced everything to follow this God. We need to do that every day. That's why I love the Lord's table. We don't just do this to check things off. It's not enough to do it quarterly. We should do this often, because as we partake by faith, we remember 
not only what God has done for us in Christ, but we remember when we gave everything up and the joy that came when we followed him at the altar and the futility of being in Egypt where there is no altar. I love that song, I'd rather have Jesus. That's an altar for Ryan Case. Because I mourn and I wonder, oh, the life that I'm in and there's snow in September, what is going on? I remember that song deeply because God used that in my conversion. When Ryan was, was a Christian and God was convicting me, out, Ryan, come and follow me. And I was wrestling. I was wrestling with love for the world, wrestling with the love of money. I was in dentistry. And I'll never forget the new job I had going up to the 16th floor, singing that song, Tears. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords me today. He is sweeter. And that altar reminds us Christ is better than the world. So come up out of the world, Christian. Return to the altar at the beginning. It's an important word, but a sheet. Where is God's grace offered? Where do we... Remember God's grace only at the altar. Not a stone altar, a wooden altar where Christ died, hung between heaven and earth for the sins of his people. The place where God accepts penitent sinners. This was between Bethel and Dei. This is where he was at the beginning. And so that's why I have no problem entitling the first point of the first journey a fresh start. He returns right where he was. You can read that in chapter 12. Where does he build the altar at the beginning? Between Bethel and Ai. Where does God bring Abram? Right back to where he was at the beginning. You, you often hear the cliche, come back to the foot of the cross. You need to. Are you struggling with sin? Are you struggling with love of the world? Back to the beginning. Back to the foot of the cross. Christians have no place leaving the foot of the cross. It's there when we wander that we get ourselves into trouble. This is the place at the beginning. This was the place he made an altar at first. But he's not just living in the past as Nathan prayed. He's not just the God of the past. He's the God of the presence. As he comes back to the altar, he prays afresh. He calls upon the name of the Lord. As he called upon the name then, he calls upon the name now. What a beautiful picture Moses gives us. The altar is the place where forgiveness is not only offered, it is the place where forgiveness is received. Will you receive it afresh? Some of you feel perhaps I've beaten you up for living in Egypt, for meandering around. Come back, come back. One of the songs Christina's always singing at home softly and tenderly Jesus is calling calling O oh sinner come home you know what the Hebrew word for the place is and underline it all the times in chapter it's makom sinner come makom come back to the place where you built that altar at first come back to Jesus humble yourself he will receive you he will not beat you up he will receive you. He has arms open wide. And yeah, that's a cliche, and I have no problem being cliched. Come back to the first place. Come back to the cross. Jesus offers you, Christian, a fresh start. And you, unbeliever, Jesus offers you a new start. Become the new creation in Christ. Come to Jesus Christ. Sinner, oh sinner, come home. The altar reminds Abram and reminds us of three crucial things he will need for his pilgrimage. <laughs> this is why we have to come to the altar because we're so desperate as pilgrims. We need three things from this altar. Three, th three things that reminds us. One, Yahweh is present in the land. He speaks as a prophet. He's not the God way up there. He's the God who's here. The altar reminds Abram of that. Ladies, as you're working through the book of Joshua, why is it so important for altars? It reminds God's people that he is with them, that he's not forsaken them. He speaks. He's not the God who is quiet, so come back and he will speak. 
He speaks from the altar that he is present. Second, he speaks from the altar that he reigns. That's what altars did. Not only did it sort of put a flag in the ground and say, Yahweh is here. It put a flag in the ground and said, Yahweh rules. Abram needs to be reminded of that because there's all these parenthetical notes. Now the Canaanites were in the land, chapter 12. Now the Canaanites were in the land. Abram needs to know that God is not only with him, that God is for him. And the God who is for him is sovereign, omnipotent, the one who spoke all things into being in Genesis chapter 1. The altar reminds Abram that Yahweh is present as prophet, that Yahweh rules as king, and praise God that Yahweh propitiates as priest. The altar reminds us of who God is for his people as prophet, priest, and king. John Calvin would be happy with that outline. He is the God who is present, the God who is powerful, and the God who propitiates What's with the big words? Well, it's alliterative, but propitiate is a good word anyways because Paul likes to use it. It has to do with wrath and the appeasement of God's wrath through sacrifice. And not just any sacrifice, substitution. That's what altar symbolized, is that I have sinned against God and this blameless, innocent substitute now dies in my place as it were, bearing the wrath of God. Christians need to be reminded of this, of their pilgrimage. You're forgiven. And because you're forgiven, God is with you. But not just any God. Christ the King is with you. So it's important to gather on the Lord's day with the Lord's people to partake of the Lord's table by faith. It reminds us of who our God is, which equips us for the pilgrimage of faith. It is not merely the place of the altar that reminds Abram that Yahweh is granting him a fresh start. Rather, it's the purpose of the altar. The altar says, Abram, I'm with you. And if you return, I will give you a fresh start. I would ask you this morning as Christ offers you a fresh start, whether as an unbeliever or as a believer, will you humble yourself? You must receive it. To receive the free offer of this gospel, you must be humbled first. And that's what happened in Egypt. You may have failed, Christian, but use, understand that God is using that to humble you. To show you how much you really need this God who is prophet and priest and king. Oh, that God would humble us increasingly as his people. Unbeliever, the call is for you now to come to Christ with your skinned up knees tattered garments and broken contrite heart call upon the name of the Lord build an altar the way Abram did in chapter 12 build it for the first time there has to be that first step I'm not very good at building I'm too young I'm talking metaphorically children come to Christ right now he will take you he will receive you give him your sins tell him your problems Believe that he is who he says and he will have you if you would have him. Believer, perhaps meandering in Egypt or smarting from a recent pilgrimage therefrom, come back to the place you first stayed your hope. Come back to the place you believed at the beginning. Return to the ABCs of the gospel. Return to the altar you made at first. With Peter in your penitence, return to Christ, your first love, where blessing is found. I see that all throughout the Old and the New Testament. Come home. Come home. Come. You who have left the love you had at first, come back to Christ. Come back. You wish the sermon was done, but it's not. That's just the beginning. God offers Abram a new start, but he doesn't offer him an easy life. He offers him a fresh start, but we see in verse 5, it's immediately followed by a new trial. Verse 5, And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. We read on that there's lots of strife, and Abram thought that maybe leaving Egypt 
would remove trials from his life. No. The Lord loves us too deeply to let us go through any part of our life without trials. You just need to accept it. Whether in feast or in famine, God will be trying your faith. And so here is Abram back in the promised land. And there's another trial. Moses has a fondness for parenthetical statements. Now is a good translation in verse 2. Now Abram was very rich. Now the Canaanites were in the land. Now this, now that. And what Moses is doing is showing us that Abram being rich didn't guarantee him a worry-free life. As anyone who's read Proverbs knows, riches bring with them peculiar trials and temptations. The things we often consider blessings often become occasions for some of our severest trials. Some people teach, oh, if you had more, more money or more blessing, life would be easier. Don't believe that lie. But let me apply this. Abram thought, oh, maybe I have more money, life will get better. Some people think that still. Or some people say, if only I had children, then I wouldn't be this. Trust me, if you have children, they bring a new set of trials. I wish I wasn't single. Once I'm married, then I'll start living the Christian life. This trial, to get out of this trial, trust me, wherever you're at, if you're a child of God, God will be testing you. He will be trying you, whether you're single, married whether you have kids or not, whether you're young, old, rich, poor, once I pay off the house, I guarantee you'll have new trials. So don't just assume trials are for then once you get everything figured out. Trials are for now. Abram was literally weighty. That's that word kavod. We saw it last week, you remember? Well, maybe not. Abram was in the promised land and there was a famine and Moses says that this famine was kavod and so we have one extreme of kavod famine starving other extreme kavod full abundant Abram was very weighty he was exceedingly weighty and if you were to read chapter 12 you would understand that these two words were used in Abram's first trial. The famine in the land was heavy. Sarah was beautiful exceedingly. Same words used. So don't think for a moment, if you had a, a prettier wife or a younger wife or a bigger bank, that's foolish to think that once this happens, then life... No, God is trying you where you're at. God is committed to refining our faith and he will use whatever circumstances we are in to wean us from the world and lean us upon Christ. It's the weaning and leaning principle. So whether you're heavy in famine or heavy in riches, realize that God wants your heart and allegiance either way. Moses says that Abram's greatness brings strife. Hebrew, his rav produces riv. See? Isn't that great? Don't you wish you could learn Hebrew it's unmistakable in the Hebrew we don't see it in the English he's Rav and it produces Riv he has greatness and it produces strife it's as simple as that the picture's simple I'm not a farmer don't think I'd have the faith to be one but livestock need to eat and there's just a limited space and God has as it were granted both these men an abundance of livestock and even a whole bunch of servants. There's just not enough land for the both of them. And so something has to happen. And if the warring between brothers, relatives, isn't bad enough, verse 7 says, Now, at that time, the Canaanites and Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Hostile, wicked enemies. And this is the trial. And we should be leaning in and saying, What is Abram going to do? Is he going to react the way he did in the trial in the promised land when there was a great famine? Is he going to trust in the flesh? Right? It's the same idea. There's a great famine, a kavod. How is he going to respond? We should be saying, Abram, what are you going to do? And he should be asking, what should I do when it happens? 
God's promise is under threat. What is Abram going to do? How is he going to respond? Is he going to work in the flesh or walk by faith? Well, we see the answer in our next section, an astounding offer. Verses 8 to 10. A new trial followed by an astounding offer, which is the answer that Abram is slowly learning to trust Yahweh. He's trusting less in himself and more in the God who makes promises. Verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. Literally it says, I love it, For we men, brothers, we are. Just very emphatic. We see already how ugly it can be when brothers have strife in the midst of an unbelieving world. But that's for another sermon. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left, I the right. You the right, then I the left. What an amazing offer. What an astounding offer. This is generosity. We might not see it unless we understand a couple things. One, Abram is 75 years old. And in that time, and as many cultures around the world know, elders carry a lot of weight. It's not like in Canada or in the States where someone older than you, you just, you just call them whatever you want. Go to the Philippines. There's a respect for the elders, for those who are older. There's a special surname or a title, I should say. It's the same there. Abram is older. He has every right to pull rank and say, Lot, hit the road. I'm the older. I get the goods. Abram could have done that. He could have used his rights if he's walking in the flesh. He could have taken all the land and given Lot the punt. Second, he has a superior army. If he's trusting in himself, he could say, I want this. And I've got some pretty fierce warriors in my camp. Hit the road, Lot, or we're going to cut you down. I was thinking of poor old Paltiel. Just do a word study on Paul Thiel and you'll know what I mean. And he's the one uh, married to Michal, Saul's daughter. And David wants her back. And uh, Paul Thiel gets the news and he's following after. And I think it's Joab. And if it's not Joab, it's Abner. He says, get back. And Paul Thiel with his tail behind his legs whimpers away because he don't want to mess with Joab. Abram could have done that. You're not messing with me. You know what? I'm just going to cut you down, Lot, and I'm going to take what I want. One, I'm older. Two, I'm superior in might. Finally, he could have pulled the spiritual card. He could have been like a pastor. God promised me. I'm going to get all spiritual on you. Remember when he appeared to me and he said, the land is for me and my offspring? You're not my offspring. Hit the road. That's how people of the flesh often respond. We can couch it in religious jargon. But at the heart of it, we're selfish. But Abram's learning grace. He's been given a new start and he's learning about the God who is full of generosity. And as you gaze upon the God of generosity at the altar that depicts his generosity, you can't help but become generous. It's the principle Piper calls beholding and becoming. Or becoming by beholding. Where's Abram before he makes this offer? He's at the altar. He is at the altar. He has just come from the altar and he says, take it all if you want, Lot. I got everything I need. You know why so many Christians are so non-generous? It's because we're not focusing on the altar. We're focusing on the world. Trust me. Focus on God and his generosity in Christ and you will become a generous Christian. Pastor, don't do that. Paul does that. You know how he gets people who are poor in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 to give beyond their ability? He reminds them of the gospel, of what Christ has done for them. That he, being infinitely rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that in him you might become rich in Christ. So here's Abram. He just comes, gazing from the altar, 
reminded of a second chance and he knows, here's the trial. How will I respond? With astounding generosity. This is how you know if someone's gotten the gospel. Not that they put little hashtags on their Twitter or post Facebook posts. Those aren't bad. This is how you know if you've gotten the gospel. Are you generous? What an astounding offer. Abram doesn't pull rank in any way with his age, his might, or his spirituality. He does none of these. He does the opposite. He totally disadvantages himself and offers Lot the cream of the crop. He puts himself at a disadvantage. This Christianity. Maybe this is a sanctified imagination. But I thought, if it was me, I'd say, well, let's do a rock, paper, scissors. Or what we do in our house when there's candy, one cuts and the other chooses. Then it's fair. Not even let's flip a coin or cast a lot. In the words of another scripture, we might say that the inferior has been blessed by the superior. Are we not surprised that Abram, as he's gazing upon the goodness of God, is increasingly becoming like that God? Abram, the inferior, is blessed by Melchizedek. And as Abram is becoming more like that Melchizedek, we shouldn't be surprised that he goes around blessing inferiors. How is this possible? Well, I have one word for you. It's grace. You're like, you used that word already. The fresh start is possible by grace. Yeah, and living generously for the good of others is also possible only by grace. Get the order right, though. God's grace to us, and then God's grace through us. Here's something I want you to take away from this. I promise we're getting there. The actions of both men proceed from what is captivated and is currently controlling their hearts and therefore their eyes. Abram's been looking on the altar. Lot is looking on the land. Abram has just received grace upon grace. His gaze is upon the goodness of God. Lot, though walking with Abram, is not walking with God. Thus his gaze is not upon the goodness of God, but the goods of God. It's a lot of Christians. All they want is the gifts, but not the giver. And Abram says the land of promise means nothing without God's presence or blessing. So what are your eyes are upon this morning? What are your eyes upon? We see where our lots are in our next section, a selfish choice. This astounding offer is followed by a selfish choice. Remember I said that lot provides for us a foil against which we are to read Abram's triumph by faith. Look at verse 11. So, Lot chose for himself. So in Hebrew, Lot is Lot, and for himself is Lo. Lot chooses Lo. Interesting. He didn't choose for God or for Abram. He chose for himself. And Lot, I believe, is a believer. How do I know that? Well, because we read in the New Testament that even Lot, as he's meandering around and getting closer and closer to Sodom and Gomorrah, it says it was vexing his soul. And so here is a man who's torn. And it reminds me that even believers can operate with hearts that are filled with selfishness. That they can seek to gain for themselves, even if it puts others at a disadvantage. Scary stuff. You can know a lot about a person by their eyes. I don't know if I should say it, but I've already committed to it in my mind, so my mouth immediately follows without no filter. And so I was texting with Charles, and he said that he had to go 
get an eye appointment. He had to get his eyes checked out. And jokingly, I said, Charles, your eyes are beautiful. And then I put, oh, you mean at the optometrist. And so I have here, you can know a lot about a person by their eyes. See, it woke you up. You can tell when a person is happy or sad, healthy or sick, by their eyes. Come into a hospital and look at the person's eyes. You will know if physically they're sick. You can know, the proverb says, that you can't, there can be joy out of the mouth, but you can know there's still sorrow in the eyes. You can know a lot about a person by their eyes. You can know that one's eyes betray one's physical health. Did you know the scriptures also teach that the eyes also betray one's spiritual health? That's a text you're probably familiar with but have never really understood. But Jesus says that the eye is the lamp of the body. And you can tell what's going on inside the body by what is coming in and captivating the eyes. So here's an example that literally just comes to mind. There can be a guy... And he's really saying pious words and talking about how he doesn't love money. And he's lifting his eyes up to heaven and then he hears a toonie fall on the ground and all of a sudden he gets excited. Now his lips are saying one thing, but the joy and excitement of what his eyes see about getting a free $2 in his pocket tells the real story of where his heart is. See, if you were to read Matthew 6, you would understand that Jesus is talking about the eye being the lamp of the body in the very context of loving money. And it's not surprising that Lot lifts his eyes up and he's so focused on the things of this world that his eyes show where his allegiance really is. Seeing is very important in the book of Genesis. It's used all the time. And what you gaze upon betrays your heart. Your eyes betray your heart. Are you on pornography all the time? It's not your eyes' fault. It's your heart. The eyes are a window into the very soul. The eyes show us what's going on the inside, irrespective of what the mouth might be saying. Moses says that Lot's choice is determined by his eyes. But his eyes are basically the mouthpiece for his heart. Lot is still selfish. Moses reminds us again of the folly of choosing with our eyes instead of our ears. I would encourage you, if you ever have time, go back and read the book of Genesis. And after God speaks, people see. And what God wants us to do is to walk by hearing what he says, not by seeing what the world presents. I get into trouble when God says this, but I see that. Despite what God said, Eve saw that the fruit was good, and she took it. Same Hebrew word, lakach. Despite what God said, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good and took it. Despite what God said, Abram saw that the famine was severe and his eyes went down to Egypt where Pharaoh saw Sarai and took her. You see the pattern? God speaks and we need to walk by hearing what he says. We're blind, but we walk by faith in God's word, not by sight. Christian, you will get into trouble if you are always following what you see rather than what God says. Beloved, God's word must control our decisions and impulse, not what the world, the flesh, and the devil set before your eyes. Careful, little children, what you see, because the eye and the heart are inextricably linked in Scripture. Because Lot was too busy looking at the things of the earth, he chose poorly, which is why Paul says, set your eyes, set your minds on things that are above where Christ is, not on the things of the earth. The fool. I don't know what the proverb is, but it says his eyes are on the ends of the earth. That's not the wise person. Our eyes are looking to Jesus. What was Lot seeing? Well, the text says here. It's well watered. It's a valley. I'm not the smartest. I betrayed that in my 
mathematical skills are not great in Sunday school, but I know that valleys allow for gravity, for water and melting snow to come down, and valleys are always well watered. And so here's Lot. That just, it's a no-brainer. Unless God says not to. Lot is seeing through the eyes of the flesh. It's well watered everywhere. It's like the garden of the Lord. It's like the land of Egypt. Now allow for some sanctified imagination. I wonder if Lot was sort of murmuring to himself and whoops, did I say that loud? He's like, I'm choosing this. It's just like Egypt. And Abram's like, I don't want nothing to do with that. Lot is too busy looking at the things of the earth and our feet always follow our eyes which follows our heart. Lot was so busy looking on that he didn't see the dangerous consequences. Here's another parenthetical comment. This was before, this is verse 10, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And Moses is warning the people of Israel and he's warning us, be careful of choosing by the flesh. It never ends well. Lot chose this foolishly, like the fool of Proverbs 5 who follows after the lusting of his heart after this woman. He does not realize that there's a whole bunch of slain people. It's the past, the refuge. He's like that, uh, that ox that has the, the arrow through its quiver or liver or whatever. Notes. Selfish decision. Abram is looking at a dusty plain. But I thought this. Through the eyes of faith, he didn't see dust. He saw offspring. Because God's word promised that. You see it in the text? Always say, is it what he's saying coming from the text? I hope so. God says, that dust, I don't think a lot of farmers would be like, yes, dust, dry, there was just a famine because there was no rain for the last couple of years. I want that. I can't imagine Dave doing the Fred Flintstone heel kick when there's just dust everywhere. It's like, um, no, I'll take the irrigation, thank you. But faith doesn't look with eyes. It listens with the ear. And God says, Abram, all that dust, I want you to see it through faith. That dust will become the fulfillment of my promise to you. Abram's learning to realize it because Yahweh is trustworthy. His word will not return void. And that as he keeps his eyes on the Lord and not the land, he will experience God's blessing in the land, God's favor, God's presence, something which Egypt or Sodom could never give. Which leads to our last section, the transforming lesson. Ryan, you've given us some Hebrew. You've walked us through the text. Excellent. Now what? Abram's learning. And I hope that as we follow along with him in this pilgrimage, that we will be learning too. In Egypt, Abram's actions of self-preservation were followed by two commands from the king. Kach, lachach. Take, go. Interestingly enough, Abram's actions of obedience in the promise are also followed by two commands from a king. Arise, walk. It's almost identical in Hebrew. But before he is given his reconnaissance mission for his feet, God first commands Abram's eyes back to the promise. That's what he's always doing. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Verse 14. For all the land that you see, I will give to you. This is all about grace. Beginning of the sermon, grace. Middle of the sermon, grace. End of the service, grace. I love Nathan's name. It's used twice here. I will give it to you. I will give it to you. I will give you my promise. Natan. That's what... Nathan means is to give. And God promises Abram, I will give these things to you. Trust in me, Abram. Let your faith direct your feet. Slowly, Abram, learn that faith comes by hearing. 
And so what does God do? He brings them back to the word of God, not to experiences, but back to the word of God. This is where we always come back to, God's word. So what's the lesson, Ryan? You still haven't told us. The lesson is simply this. If you want to hear from God more, obey God's word now. You need to let that sink in. Do not think that God will reveal more of himself to you now if you're disobeying the revelation he's already given you. Where do you get that from? Well, buckle yourself in. I'm going to give you a plethora of scriptures from the text. God speaks to Abram his blessing after he obeys. Prove it. Abram trusts God and leaves Ur. God speaks to him in Haran, Genesis 12. Abram trusts God and leaves Haran, and God speaks to him in Canaan, chapter 12. Abram trusts himself and enters Egypt, and God remains silent to him. Okay, that's the antithesis. He obeys, God speaks. He obeys, God speaks. He disobeys, God is silent. Abram trusts God and blesses Lot, and he speaks to him here in chapter 13. Abram trusts God, saves Lot. God speaks to him in chapter 15. Abram walks with God and obeys him. God speaks to him in Genesis 17. Abram offers his son on the altar in obedience, and God speaks to him. Do you see the pattern? I'm not getting into moralistic teaching. I'm just saying the text says, That God reveals himself increasingly as Abram obeys God in the present. And there's so many Christians saying, I just wish God would tell me what to do. And it's like, obey him. Obey him now. Don't worry about what he'll say tomorrow. What has he told you? And this is where I should start applying. I don't know what God is putting on your heart. Maybe it's to be generous and start giving to the church. Maybe it's to support missions. Maybe it's to encourage someone. Maybe it's to rebuke someone. Maybe it's to share the gospel with someone at work. God has been putting on your heart and you refuse to share the gospel despite his convictions. I don't know. There's too many people to apply it to. But I do know this. If you have the spirit of God, he has been convicting you to do something. Some of you need to forgive somebody. God, why are you so distant? Because you're not obeying his command to forgive. It's just, it's an impossibility for you to experience God's blessing while you're living in disobedience. He will become increasingly silent to you as you disobey him. That's not moralistic, that's biblical. Abram trusts God. Take it, Lot, God is better. God says, Abram, I'll show you myself in ways you've never dreamed. That's the lesson. If we want God to reveal himself and his will for us more fully in the future, we must obey him more fully in the present. Read your Bibles and say, not only what is God teaching me about himself, what is God challenging me to obey by faith? Too many Christians just read and they stop there and there's no obedience. And we wonder why people look at Reformed Baptists and say, well, you're just a whole bunch of heady people, but there's really no experience because we don't obey. Now, you can quickly dismiss this and say, Ryan's a legalist. He's telling me I need to obey to receive God's blessing. No, the blessing comes as you receive it by faith, which evidences itself in obedience. I would ask you this, Christian, what has God been convicting you to do? Maybe it's to start reading your Bible more. Maybe it's going to bed and watching less YouTube at night so you can wake up and read the Bible. I don't know. As hard as whatever he is calling you to do may seem, let me ask you this. Is it worth God's silence? Is it worth it? Is being selfish with your money worth God's silence? A lot of people here who are not giving to the work of God financially. And you wonder why God's not speaking. It's because God will not allow for idolatry in his kingdom. Is your disobedience worth God's silence? If you're a Christian, you will say, no. I will take the hard route. I need Jesus. Some of us want to keep in step with the Spirit. But that next step is hard. And I would ask you this. As scary as that next step may seem, is it worth the absence of God's blessing? Thankfully, though, Moses' final words to us in this chapter emphasize not Abram's doing, but God's giving.
giving. I will give, I will give. And Abram ends where he begins in this chapter. At the altar of God. See it? Thankfully the chapter's broken up, but even if it wasn't, we begin at an altar and we end at an altar and we're reminded that everything that we have and even everything we will do is predicated upon God's sovereign grace. Abram's trusting God and he's worshiping him. I would invite you to do the same thing. I would invite you to do the same thing. Come to the fresh start. Understand there will be a new trial, but you can still be generous and you can still learn the lesson that as you follow God, as you trust him, as you obey him, you will experience more and more of the blessing. Money? No, no, no. God's presence. Father, we want to thank you for your word. And as we come to the Lord's table, to this altar, would you remind us that it is the offer of a fresh start, that Christ on the cross is the supremest expression of your grace to undeserving, ill-deserving, and hell-deserving sinners. Father, I pray that we would come to this altar with our knees skinned up, and that we would come with our contrite hearts and we would come with all of our mistakes and we would lay them there and we'd receive afresh the washing, that we would receive afresh the forgiving, that we'd re- re- receive afresh all that you are for us, Father, in Christ. Father, I pray that you will work mightily in us. Father, I pray that we would be not only uh, an obedient people, but a worshiping people, which is really the same thing. Father, work deeply in us. And I pray if there's anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, would you humble them? Would you you squeeze them into such a place that all they can do is bow their knee and cry out to Jesus? Would you even give them that conviction and would you also give them the faith and repentance necessary to be saved? And for those of us, Lord, whether we are more like Lot or Abram, would you help us to walk by faith? Would you help us to receive afresh your grace and then to live graciously in this world that others might see? God, we love you. And I ask by your spirit that we would keep our eyes fixed this week, not upon the ends of the world or the things of the world, but upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes truly fixed on him and to live accordingly, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.